everybody. What's going on, everybody? Are you super psyched for the grand finale? I know you are. I'm super pumped for the grand finale. Let me tell you, this is the Wednesday, the Ember Day, Wednesday, December 15th edition of Paleocrat Diaries, and I am your host, the one and only Paleocrat Jeremiah Bannister. <laughs> are you super psyched, super pumped? You better be, and why? You have a lot of reasons. Not only because today is the day that the Lord has made and we are going to rejoice because we're glad, trans, but we have <laughs> we have 200 extra reasons today to be glad. Because we reached, over at the Wolfpack chat on Telegram, we reached 200. And last night, <laughs> we had a party. We had a party. We were rocking it out for hours. We recorded it. There's going to be sections of that that will be shared. We'll share uh, different sections so that people can get a feel for the, the way we roll over there. Uh, we had ourselves, what was it? Founders, four giants. We had some founders, right? What, what, what is that? 9.2 ABV. I had some of this donut cider. My wife had some, some of this uh, 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 old orchard cider. Super delicious. We were eating pizza. We were eating breadsticks. And we were debating theology <laughs> on the Wolfpack chat. Amazing conversations, deep-rooted conversations, right? Going back and forth, doing a little swashbuckling here, a little swashbuckling there. And loving each other all the while. We were there to have a good time. And that's what we did, because that's what we do here. And we take a simple stance, don't we? Every single day, Johnny Q and Sally Sue, all around the world, taking the stance and the posture that they are taking a knee for Christ the King, because he rules over heaven and earth, over all of human history. No matter how bad it gets, he's in control. So what do we do? We make a vow, never give up, keep on smiling, and remember that you are going to die. Simple as that. So we dream bigger thoughts, don't we? We dream super big thoughts. And one of those things, people are like, dude, you had 200 people, <laughs> 200 members over at the Wolfpack chat, and you guys are partying, and you're like, yes, <laughs> we party. I think, I think that the wolves, I think the wolves over there at the chat, I think they would party at every single additional person, if they could. <laughs> we would be like, oh, we have 132, and they're like, party time. <laughs> you're like, slow, slow down the roll a little bit. Slow down the roll a little bit. So we got to, you know, it's an amazing amazing time and those 200 people i'll tell you you know and i show you every show i'm not going to spend as much time today because we have in a, we have an epic video okay by the way have you loved having people like david uh Hullava on board have you loved having jake fowler on board we have somebody else too we have somebody else too and we're really excited about that we will do an announcement Let's just say it, uh, Kyla, the, her Miss Preeti, okay, that we are going to have her on as well. Now, it's going to be, I think, mainly just articles with her, although she may make videos now and again. But we're going to talk about it. That's over at thebyzantinelife.com. You can follow her work over there. We connected. And, it, and how awesome is this, right? We said, what was it? Just last week. We said, look, we really, we, <laughs> we need to get more of the ladies over here. We do, right? It's good to, to talk about masculinity. It's good to talk about manly things. I'm meaning of Catholic, but it's lopsided. And I said, we need to have more of the ladies over here. And all of a sudden, there was a massive influx of the ladies coming into the Wolfpack chat. A whole bunch more. Okay, a whole bunch more. And they helped to make it what it is. But I said, it's got to be more than that. It has to be at the level of presentation. It has to be at the level of what we do here. And it was great because my buddy, Lyndon, okay, Lyndon, and if you haven't seen any of his videos, he interviewed me, interviewed, he's been on uh, Meaning of Catholic. Tim interviewed him a couple times. Great guy. He's written over at 1 Peter 5. Really great dude uh, over there in Canada, uh, Byzantine Catholic. And, uh, you know, he, a great guy, well, he calls me because we talk on the phone. And he calls me. We get talking. And he said, you know, I had mentioned before about him and, and the, the apostolate over there being more engaged with what we do over here. And he said, yeah, he said, I talked to my wife and my wife would really be interested in doing that. And I thought, are you serious? <laughs> like, it was the same day as I talked about it on the show. I thought he just watched the show. I said, did you see today's show? And he goes, no, what, what? <laughs> he had no clue. And I said, that's a God thing, brother. That's a God thing, homie. I, I know, I know some, of the, some of the more secular people would say, oh, that's just a coincidence. 
And I go, you know what? I mean, I may, I might make it to heaven. And the Lord goes, you know, it was kind of, you know, it just happened to be that way. <laughs> and I say, well, fault me on the side of seeing good things and little stuff like that. And I see God's hand in all of it and say, you know what? Look at this. Look at this. The empire is expanding. Tim Flanders was right when he said that. He said the paleocrat empire is expanding. And it has. It has expanded bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm going to be taken off three weeks, though. And I'm not the only one. I think Kennedy, I think, is doing the same thing. Uh, uh, other people on different channels doing the same thing, spending the winter break with their kids. And it's, it's kind of a hangover a little bit from legacy media to say, you know, you have to have that, that, that pause where it's between seasons. And I, I view this as season. This is, this is the grand finale of season one. And what, what a great way to end off on season one, isn't it? To go, look at what we've accomplished. Look at the things that we've accomplished. I wish I had a montage. <laughs> I should make a montage. I'll, I'll make it during the three weeks. I'll still make videos. They'll be shorter videos. Uh, I'll still make some of those, you know, stuff like that that we can post in Meaning of Catholic. And if you notice that, they've been posting clips. So a lot of stuff is up our sleeve, right? And 2022 is just going to be bigger and better than ever. <laughs> We're going to rock it out in 2022. We are going to rock it out. We're going to love it. Uh, it's been a great year but it's gonna get even better. And it's getting better and better all the time because of people like you. And I, I know it sounds so cheesy. And I said it last night at the end of the party with everybody, I said, you know, I said, here's the thing, like you guys just don't even really fully understand when I'm saying what I'm saying that, you know, for a long time I would talk into microphones and in some ways it did feel like you're screaming into a pillow almost, or you know, some kind of air sealed, soundproofed room. And you're just going and you're, you're screaming into the air. But you had to believe. You said, look, I prayed about it, discerned about it. I believe that, that God is saying that this is what I ought to do with my gifts and talents. And I'm going to do it even if it's to a party of one. I'm going to give it everything I've got, even if only 10 people see it. I will do my absolute best all the time. And I said, but the more and more that people came in, and the more and more that I began to see the people praying and that they were reaching out to each other, becoming friends, getting excited over little things, easily entertained, no doubt about it. <laughs> we're easily entertained people. We are. We say, look, you know, we're, we're constantly bedazzled by the Lord all the time and by all of the great people that he's placed in our lives. And I said, the, the wolf pack, this idea, I, I remember going on Telegram, had no intention of doing much with it. I was just escaping Facebook. I wanted to go somewhere where I could just simply post and not be afraid I was going to get censored or deplatformed or having a you know, social media mob all over my back. And I'm like, I, I want to go somewhere where I can do that. I created it. Never anticipated that it would become the, the, <laughs> the metropolis of comments that it is today. Right? It's, 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 it's this crazy thing. You know, you roll in. You've been gone for a day. You roll in and it's like a thousand comments. <laughs> like, <laughs> what is this? And I say, marvelous, marvelous. It's the Lord at work. And you can see it in the lives of all those people. You can see it in the lives of them because they come from different backgrounds. They come from different places. They come bearing different gifts and talents. And yet they have a heart that kind of beats not entirely the same, but it creates a song right? That there's a harmony to it. There's a melody at play. Do, 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 do. <laughs> and it would sound pretty cool, right? And so you sit there and you say, look at the way that this works. Look at the way that people connect. Look at the way that they learn each other. Look at the way that they benefit from prayers or from resources. And look at what it's done to our show. Look at what it's done. You know, here, here's a great example. Let me just, let me just pop this up. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Yeah, look at this example. <laughs> This one's dedicated to Veronica, <laughs> our librarian over at the book club. And that's the thing. We, we started with just a simple chat with nobody in there. And now we've got a book club, right? We've got a prayer chain. Reason and theology is over there now, right? In fact, the, the 200th member at the Wolfpack chat came from Reason and Theology. More and more people are coming in from over there, okay? We got an art and poetry page, St. Catherine's Atrium, Right? The Phil Gonzalez Show, he's a guy in our group posting videos and, and different songs and stuff. The Wolfpack Resources. You can get the PDF, Orthodoxy, G.K. Chesterton. And, and all those you can read and download and everything else. The Book Club right there, the Canine Brigade. Okay, Alpha Pack, Super Friends, for all the members and all the patrons, please 
please go. I'll, I'll post more specifically just to you guys and ladies during the break because I'm really, really insisting <laughs> that, that you just go over here because that way you're going to be able to get all of the material that you want to get and we're going to be able to do chats with each other. We don't have to say, well, what program do you want to use over here and over there and over here? We don't have to worry about that. And I've got it set up for the different levels, 25, 10, all of it, okay? So I'll be sending stuff out to you there. But all of those, all of those different places. But there was something I, I just wanted to show you. And by the way, if people are playing the, uh, you can go and you can find the number one free bingo card generator. That's the Paleo Bingo. It's, if there are certain phrases that I say on the show, you can play the game. And if you end up winning, there's a, I think, I forget what the prize is. <laughs> it might be magnets that we get, right, from the Trinity and Brewing Company. We, we still have to, to give away the book for uh, uh, Tim Flanders' new book. I have a copy of that that uh, was a gift sent and, and donated, right, by Phil Gonzalez. And so we're really grateful for him. But you can go ahead. Yeah, sorry for the mix-up, Paleo Bingo. So you'd have to go to, I guess, the second one, I guess. Um, and so, you, yeah, okay, Paleo Bingo, big letters and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, you can go and check that out. But right here, this is what I'm really wanting to show you, okay? So here's the thing. We, we, get a, we get a prayer request from somebody, right, in, in, the, in the Wolfpack prayer chat, talking about how the father-in-law was rushed into the hospital the morning, uh, in the morning. Well, uh, uh, yeah, Bob, uh, please rattle the beads for this man and for all who are sick right now, especially those sick with COVID. I appreciate you all more than you could know. Have a blessed Ember Wednesday. I don't know if that's his, his stepdad, uh, his uh, uh, father-in-law. I'm not sure. Because right here is what I was thinking. Andrew Stahl, we've talked about him before. And right? I've said he's like the wolf pack, is the wolf of the year for us. <laughs> he is. He, he's, he's been such a blessing to have in the group and the, in the comments section. It's been such a blessing, Andrew. But he said, friends, my stepfather Ron passed away this morning in New Mexico with no family or friends around him. Please pray for his soul and my mother. And thanks again for all your prayers throughout this experience. And somebody said back, sorry to hear, hear that, brother. Please know that he has a wolf pack of people praying for the repose of his soul. And Andrew replied, thank you. He was truly a wolf at heart, and I'm sure he will thank you one day. It's numbered up to 160, the prayer list. Haley posted that. Had to stop to, get, to go to school. There's more. There's more. So there's more than 160. She only got to that because she's got to get going with school. <laughs> so if you want to join in that, I mean, just, just think for a second. Just think for a second. Say, you know, you, you, you follow different shows, right? You get in comments. You enjoy the back and forth you have with people. Or so, there's a little bit of a camaraderie. How often are you getting in comments like that on the regular where you get to know that person and that person is reaching out to you, right? And saying, look, you, you guys have been praying. This is what happened. Sometimes it goes good. There was an update on my sister. Things are, things are surprising the doctors. <laughs> things are surprising the doctors. Well, things are seeming to get better. We didn't know how, or the cancer's not. We thought it would be bigger based on various markers, and we took a scan, and it's, it's bigger, but not nearly as, as dangerous as we thought, with the location of it and stuff. And you sit there, and they're like, you know, it's kind of amazing. And we go, I know. <laughs> and, and look, there's a lot of people praying for my sister. There's a lot of people praying for these folks too. But in here, we're a wolf pack of prayer. We, we really mean it when we say that. We record rosaries, we record chaplets that we do, litanies that we do. We share those things together so that you can listen in the car while you're driving or working out or whatever, and you're praying and you're connecting with real people. And again, that final, that, those final words right there, right? I appreciate you all more than you could know. He means that, by the way. And I do too. You, and maybe that's something we all have in common. We're all looking at each other saying, I appreciate you more than you could possibly know. And we're all saying that to each other because we have the different reasons for doing that. And before going on to, to Jake, because Jake's coming up here next year. You know, the thing is, is that I look at it and I say, you know, you, you, there could be so many things that I could ask for. Right? I want big numbers. I want to be in the thousands all the time with the view count. I want to see the comments, 
you know, after the show's done, I want to have a hundred comments in there and everything else. I could say all those things, but the truth is, and, and wouldn't that be a wonderful Christmas, right? To say, look at how we've grown. Look at how now we're just, we're, we're really bumping. We're out there and we are. I mean, look, we got, we, I got an interview tomorrow and then I got another interview uh, on the 20th. Okay. Then I got another interview in January. So we're, we're making strides. But all of that, what would be the use of any of those things? What would, what would it be other than just huff puffery, right? Just simply puffing yourself up with pride if it wasn't for that heartbeat in the wolf pack. If it wasn't for you and all the things that you say and do that make us who we are, that, to me, what I could not ask for something greater in a professional sense. I could not ask for something greater. In fact, in my entire career, and I've been at this game, I've been doing some kind of radio or podcasting or whatever since I was like 15 years old. AMFM radio, 15 years old. In my entire career, I've never been more proud of something. And it's not just something, it's people. And it's just such an honor. It's just such an honor. So I just want to thank all of you again. And make sure, if you're not part of the Wolfpack chat, I know I joke around about it and stuff, and I, and I say you're crazy. You you are. <laughs> you are if you're not there. You're a loon, you're a complete loon bird. <laughs> out of your mind. What's wrong with you? Haven't you seen the smoke signals? You should be looking out the window more, you know, kind of thing. Unless you got to board it up and stuff, when, when you wax candles and such. But, you know, the thing is, like, if you're looking out the window and you're seeing those smoke signals, you probably have carrier pigeons just tapping at that door. Rat-a-tat-tat. At the window, tick, 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 tick. and you're like, "Why are these pigeons? Why are these carrier pigeons always around?" Because they're bringing the message to you that we are waiting, we are anticipating your arrival, we're excited to get to know you already, and you have a place at our table because you have a place in our heart, and because you have a place in our prayer already. We're grateful. All righty, now listen, we're gonna move on here. We're going to move on to the ecumenical council. This is going to be, this is a little bit longer. We're going to let it roll. Uh, we're going to let it play. It's all together 43 minutes. And so I'm going to step out here for a little bit and uh, let this go. This is Jake Fowler. He's, he's bringing us from Nicaea to Constantinople. Okay. So we're, he's, he's continuing that series on ecumenical councils. So a lot, and there, there are some people that maybe you you, maybe you have studied this before and you know it before. There are many who do not. And as I said, this show this is a really, this is a, a niche market, right? That we say we are really a show for the Johnny Q and Sally Sue, which is funny because I know <laughs> I have people reach out to me and sometimes they show up in the comments section, you know? Uh, well, speaking of that, I should just, just greet people very quickly. But I, I know scholars also tune in. I know people, smarty pants, right? smarty pants people, they also tune in, okay? But right here, let's go find out. Let's go see some of these folks, right? So, okay. Oh, well, up there. Yeah, Phil Gonzalez. Yes, thank you, by the way. Thank you, by the way. Not only for, I think I showed it on, um, I showed it on um, Reason and Theology. Check this out. Yeah, Phil sent that to our family. Our kids go to Sacred Heart. Okay. And we go to, they go to Sacred Heart Academy. We go to Sacred Heart Parish. And so the Sacred Heart is, plays a prominent role in our life. And he saw it and thought of us. And so, very grateful. Jacob Fowler, he's in the comments. We're just going to start with him here in a moment. Gary Bamberg, good evening. It's nice to see you there, Gary. I don't know where you are, but yeah, other side of the planet, I'm supposing, yeah. The Mule Breeder, why not? <laughs> good morning, afternoon. Yes, uh, nice, nice to see you there, uh, Mule Breeder. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, so, all right. Uh, yes, and we missed you, by the way, Christine, at the party. Christine is one of those prayer warriors. Her and Haley both, right there. They're lined up together. They, those, two, those two are praying all the time. You want, you want to, if you want to trust that somebody is praying for you, you go to that prayer chat, right? Go to the Wolfpack chat. You'll get an introduction from our welcome bot, right? He's our butler. <laughs> and he will give you all the links to you can find the book club and all that. If you go in there, you're going to see Christine and you're going to see Haley Lou. You're going to see him and praying all the time, praying all the time. They're at the heart of everything we do here. Let's see. No plagiarism compa complaints from the wolf gangsters? <laughs> Is there wolf gangsters? I don't know anything about that. <laughs> Wait, my son's wolf gang. I, where are the wolf gangsters? I don't know anything about those. <laughs> Let's see here. I just need him to say one key phrase when people get demoted. What? What? I don't even know what you're talking about. 
I don't know what you're talking about. Let's see. All right. Yeah, so yeah, as if, if integralism is on the menu. If you want to ask questions about if you want to ask questions about my political theory, it's kinda of, it's kind of funny. I, I showed up on Monday, I was supposed to debate with Kennedy Hall on the state. And they've been going back and forth because we got Luis now. By the way, Luis had a, apparently an excellent episode yesterday. I have not had the chance to see it because we were in our festivities and stuff. And so um, a, a really great one. But I we've been going back and forth with the times. If Luis is able to make it at six, if he's not, it's five. So it's not, it's kind of a little bit difficult. And I thought it started at six. Well, it started at five. So I'm showing up like <laughs> thinking I'm on time. I'm like, it, it's like 545 and I'm rolling in like, yeah, this is good. And I get in there and they're already on the air. <laughs> and I'm like, oh no. So I didn't hear anything that was said before. So I get on and I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm asking for definitional things and stuff like that. We're just kind of talking. And we had a number of agreements and people were like, well, look, I think, you know, that, that uh, uh, Kennedy Hall's idea, it seems like Jeremiah's down with it. It seems like it's all working. I'm like, no, <laughs> we have major time disagreements here. So the next next Monday is going to be, I believe, just me. Kennedy's not going to be honest. It's going to be me. I'm going to talk about uh, my views of the state. I'll make sure to watch Kennedy's episode uh, where he talked for 45 minutes to get a better idea for what he said beforehand. Um, but yeah, suffice to say, I'm, I'm quite confident that we're going to have major disagreements. And if you have any questions or comments for me in this video, make sure to put the little at symbol there at Meaning of Catholic, because I'm signed in with Meaning of Catholic right now to stream this video. So if you put Meaning of Catholic with that, it will highlight it orange. If anybody can do that right now, I don't think anybody's done it yet. If you go ahead and you highlight that, uh, or uh, put that in there, then you'll go ahead and you will see, uh, you, you will see what I'm talking about. It makes it easier for me to notice that someone's asking a question or making a comment directed specifically to me. So make sure if you want me to respond specifically, I don't want to go through and have to go through each and every one and everything else. Don't have to do that. Um, but just go ahead and just and put uh, the little at symbol and that will highlight it and I'll be able to, to, to check that out. So, all right. Yeah. Uh, uh, Bedros says, I really like this man's broadcasting. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And it's only going to get better. Right? Like I said, we got more people coming up. We got more people who are, yep, right there. So Jacob Fowler, he put it on. Uh, the the highlighted portion there, so that shows you what I will see. It makes it much easier for me to know that you're addressing me. Yeah, and it took the mule breeder. It took it took me to get used to it. Talking about the the broadcasting. Yeah, it's a different it's a different thing, man. I'm, I'm kind of a standalone. People say in the in the tratosphere, right? It would be like um you know I'm trying to think. It'd be like Michael Savage stylistically, like Michael Savage. And Alex Jones, like somehow they had this, you know, <laughs> some kind of a weird concoction, <laughs> Frankenstein baby <laughs> of the two of them. And then you hyper infuse that person with Catholicism <laughs> and said, said, OK, now what do you got? And you're like, oh, that's paleo crack. Yeah, that's paleo crack. And so, yeah, so I, I've, I, I, I know that the style of the show is different. I know that my presentation is different, stuff like that, especially when the music's bumping and we're getting into it right out of the get go. Uh, I know that's the case. And so. But I'm glad you. I'm glad you kept along. Glad you kept along. So all right, yes, and pray for the uh, Reconquista. Uh, I'm discerning a vocation. A prayer would be appreciated. Haley, in fact, can add that. She can add that. Yep, to our prayer list specifically for you. And you will not just have one person praying. You will have multiple people praying, and they will be praying regularly, even during bringing the prayer list to mass and everything. So all right, no further ado. I already talked too much. Here we go. We're going to talk about ecumenical council. This is your boy. This is Jake Fowler with his presentation of Nicaea to Constantinople. Part three, part three, the ecumenical councils. We have been covering Nicaea, right? We didn't really get very far. Uh, we did the lead up to Nicaea. We talked about a little bit of theology. We did Nicaea itself. We did the immediate aftermath. Um, gosh, how rude of me. 
My name is Jake Fowler. I'm here with Paleocrat Diaries. Thanks to Jeremiah once more. Uh, today, we are going to cover, uh, well, we're going to continue on with the aftermath of Nicaea 1. And we're going to work our way up to the First Council of Constantinople. And we're just going to see how far we get, because we've got plenty of time. Let's face it, I'm not going anywhere. Kaiser's not going anywhere. And uh, yeah, this is going to be great. So without further ado, goodbye music. Hello, outline. Here we go. So uh, to recap from last week, we left off right around the year 360. And Athanasius is in exile. A lot of the other Nicene bishops are in exile or have been deposed. Um, the emperor, Constantius, is hostile to the faith. His brother, Constans, was sort of a mitigating factor, but Constans had died. Constantius II is ruling over the Roman Empire solely. There have been these creeds promulgated at these semi-Aryan councils and synods all over the Roman world, and it seems, again, St. Jerome's comment, that the world woke and groaned to find itself Arian. And I mentioned last time, a little cliffhanger there, was that it seemed like all hope was lost for uh, the creed of Nicaea, for the divinity of Christ, and by extension, for the church and the Christian faith as a whole. We know better, obviously, but let's take a look at what happened. In 361, Constantius II died. He was baptized on his deathbed, just like his father. And so again, we have decent reason, maybe a slightly less than Constantine, but not a bad reason to think that there's a Saint Constantius II in heaven. His successor was his cousin, Julian. Now, Julian... He kind of had a rough go at the beginning of his life. You see, Constantine had his entire family slaughtered. That's a stain on his record. Julian was uh, just a small boy at the time. This occurred, obviously, prior to Constantine's death. And uh, Constantine had his son killed, his son's whole family killed, and the only one who was spared was this Julian. Right, and of course, Constantine had three other sons. We talked about them uh, in the, in the last episode. So Julian, you could kind of understand why he doesn't really think much of Christianity, right? His father, or excuse me, um, his his relative had killed his father. So this would have been his his granddad or some sort of great uncle. The relation is a little unclear, but he's some kind of cousin to Constantius the second. So again, he naturally had a disdain for the Catholic faith. He started off as a Christian emperor, but it wasn't long before the game was up, right? He stopped pretending, and he wanted to bring back the paganism of the good old days. And so he, he works towards that end, right? He uh, prohibits Christian teachers and schools. He allows no public teaching of Christianity. He removed uh, the church's immunity from taxes, and he, he sort of withdrew their ecclesiastical jurisdictions in certain areas. Um, the one thing that he really did, which I, I really want to mention because it's such an interesting story, uh, in order to thwart Christianity, Julian, who's, who goes down in history as Julian the Apostate, Julian the Apostate, he thinks, well, you know what? I know enough Christian theology that I know that Christ is the new temple and the mass is the one sacrifice of the new covenant. So if I rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, then that'll show those Christians because then I will have undone the faith in their God, Christ. So they prepare all the materials they begin preparing the spot on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, but joke's on him. 
there was a series of natural disasters. There was an earthquake, I believe, and there was fire that came forth from the earth, and it consumed some of the workers, and others were too scared to go on. So the project was abandoned. And I have to wonder, just like we saw uh, with the death of Arius, is this God acting providentially? I, I would say yes, clearly. Right. One other thing that Julian the Apostate did to try to thwart Christianity and to really uh, make a mess of the Christian world was to allow all the deposed bishops to return to their sees. Now, I don't know how much Julian kept up with church controversy, but this allowed many of the Nicene bishops to return from exile to come back into their cities, to be back with their people, and this included Athanasius. Now, just in time, right, the hammer of heretics, St. Athanasius, he's just in time to fight two new heresies. As if one wasn't enough, now we've got two more that kind of make their way to the forefront. They never were as big a problem as Arianism, but heresy is always an issue, no matter how big or small it is. The two, they've got funny names, Pneumatomachianism and Apollinarianism. Let's start with Pneumatomachianism. This is Greek for spirit fighters. These are the folks who did not believe in the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Um, side note, they're also called Macedonians, not because of where they were from, but because they were named, uh, or, or they picked up this name somehow, from a bishop whose name was Macedonius, who apparently had very little to do with them at all. So, kind of funny, and sucks for that guy. Now, these people, like I said, these Pneumatomachians, they denied that the Holy Spirit was truly God. This is the same fundamental error that Arius and his companions made in effort to preserve the divinity of the Father, the unicity of the Godhead. They want to subordinate, right? So these, these folks would have said, well, we're okay with the Son being divine, but we don't know about this spirit. We're not sure about that. They viewed him as a creature made by the sun. He's the first and most glorious of creatures, but a creature nonetheless. Ergo, not God. Apollinarianism, the second heresy that's propping up, cropping up at this time. Named for Apollinaris, who was bishop of Laodicea. Now, Apollinaris is the first one to really make waves with Christological heresies. So Arianism, Pneumatomachianism, and their ilk, right, the semi-Arians and all that, those are Trinitarian heresies because they have to do with the relation within the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one to the other. Christological heresies have to do with the person of Christ. Who was he? What was he? Apollinaris, this bishop, he accepted Trinitarian theology. He was a Nicene. He was a champion of Nicene Orthodoxy because he believed fully that the Son, the Word, was God. He was fully divine. Apollinaris's error, uh, well, obviously he didn't think it was an error, but his mistake was that he believed the Word took on human flesh only. Not a human mind, not a human soul or a human will, just the flesh. And so it's Apollinaris who is a proto-monophysite. He's an unwitting monophysite. Because if you follow out his thinking to its logical conclusion, he denies that Christ has a fully human nature because he denies that Christ has a human mind, a human will, uh, a human soul, in other words. So he can't have a full human nature. He doesn't have full humanity the way we know is correct. So Apollinaris says, well, maybe there's just one nature, God the Word incarnate, just one nature in Christ. 
Athanasius took up the, the battle against not only Arianism, but Apollinaris and the Pneumatomachians, the Macedonians. He countered them using primarily scripture. And he says, look, we can see from the Holy Scriptures that the Holy Spirit is life-giving, that he's from God. He's, he's said to be from the Father. He's said to be sent by the Son. The Holy Spirit is sanctifying. He's unchangeable. He's unique. He's omnipresent. He couldn't be all of these things if he weren't God. If he, di if he divinizes, he must be divine. That's to put it rather simply. If the Holy Spirit divinizes us, he must be divine. All right? Think of that passage in John. If he leads the apostles into all truth, he must be divine. No truth is unattainable for the Holy Spirit. Christ himself is the truth, capital T. Therefore, the Spirit can lead us fully into Christ. That can't happen if the Spirit is a creature. So based on these things, Athanasius demonstrates that the Pneumatomachians are mistaken, that the Holy Spirit is God. He must be God. But there's a problem. Athanasius, out of deference for pious custom, for tradition, you might say, he never calls the Holy Spirit God. Hmm. What do we make of this? I mean, he, he would have said that this would have been an innovation of sorts. Nobody was calling the Holy Spirit God, even the ones who thought that he was. Is this a stain uh, on Athanasius's record? Like last week, last, last episode, we talked about the, the stain on the record of Pope Liberius and Hosius of Cordoba. And just a few moments ago, the stain on the record of Constantine, one of many for sure. Is this a stain on Athanasius? Hard to say. Maybe yes, maybe no. Couldn't he have said the Holy Spirit is God, fully divine? What's the hang-up? But then again, nobody else is saying this. Is it an innovation? Are we allowed to say this? I don't think we should get too hung up on it. I don't think we should let semantics get in the way of real meanings. Let's move on. Let me tell you about some imperial developments happening around this time. Julian, the apostate emperor, he didn't last very long. He died in 363, succeeded by a military commander named Jovian. So we had Julian, now we have Jovian. And this dude is personally orthodox. And as a matter of fact, he almost brokered a reunion between the church and the see of Antioch. If you recall, I mentioned previously that after Nicaea, when some of the first Nicenes are beginning to be deposed, there was this Eustathius of Antioch. And he maybe insulted the empress mother, St. Helena, by calling her a stabularia, a chambermaid, right, which, given the situation back then, meant that basically she was a prostitute. Uh, he was clearly not a big fan of hers. She got wind of it. She was not a big fan of his. Eustathius is out. The Arians try to set up an Arian bishop in Antioch, but the people reject him. And because they can have no bishop and they're no longer obedient— uh, they're, they're rejecting candidates left and right. They went into schism, right? The bishop that eventually was there, Miletius, he was not recognized by Rome. He refused to have communion with some others. Jovian almost healed that. He brings in Athanasius to speak with Miletius to get him and Liberius on the same page. Miletius hesitated to commune with Athanasius. So Athanasius recognizes the other bishop, Paulinus. Paulinus was an old Nicene, and Miletius of Antioch was sort of 
in the middle of the controversy. Overall, probably a better bishop, but he hesitated, like I mentioned. And Athanasius, this left a bad taste in his mouth. He's like, oh, fine, heck with you. I'm going to go and have communion with Paulinus, and we're going to recognize him as the legitimate bishop of Antioch. Jovian, for all of his efforts, he died in 364, just a year later. And now two guys come into power, Valentinian in the west and his brother Valens in the east. I don't know if you've noticed this. It's, it's just occurred to me. Every time we have a new set of names, they seem to come in pairs, right? Strange. Well, Valentinian, uh, unlike his brother Valens, he operated the West on a policy of more or less religious toleration. He believed laymen should not meddle in ecclesiastical affairs. This was pretty rare, again, given the standards of the time, the fact that the emperors usually believed themselves to be responsible for the religion of their people. The emperor was supposed to be pleasing to God, and in order to do that, he had to enforce religious matters. Well, Valentinian wasn't like that. He allowed the Arians to be Arians. He allowed the Catholics to be Catholics. Although I do have to say, he did not allow Arianism to spread outside of a few small pockets. In the West, there were mostly Nicenes. When they weren't being persecuted by Constantius or Julian the Apostate, they were free to be Orthodox. And because he didn't interfere with the Nicenes, the faith in the West was more or less secure. And I mentioned a second ago that Arianism was somewhat confined. Valens, on the other hand, his brother, he was a meddler, right? He was like uh, Scooby-Doo, right? Always kind of getting his nose where it really doesn't belong. He attempted to impose what's called uh, a minimalist formula on the bishops of the East and, by extension, on the bishops of the West. He wanted everybody to rally around this one term that we can all agree on. Why can't we just all get along, right? Homoios. Not homoousios, consubstantial. Homoios, which means like. He says, Okay, the official religious policy in the Roman Empire, at least as far as I'm concerned, is that the Son is like the Father. Not technically wrong. The Son is like the Father. Because if you are consubstantial, if you are the same in divinity, then you're also like. So he, he tries to impose homoios on the church. He thought this was a middle ground be between Arianism and Catholicism. And he sent um, bishops to appeal not only to Pope Liberius, but to his brother. And no luck. No luck. The Western bishops want to have nothing to do with homoios. They want Nicene Orthodoxy, consubstantial homoousios. They went to the Pope as well. He required them to profess belief in the Nicene Creed. He rejected the compromise terms of like, and there was another one actually. You could see the, the theological confusion of this age is just rampant. So in addition to homoios, there was also homoousios, like in substance. Like in substance, again, not untrue, but it's not accurate enough to thwart Arianism. These were the semi-Arian terms, right? So it's not enough to just say the son is like the father. It's true, but it's not enough. It's not enough even to say he's like in substance. We have to go all the way and say he is the same in substance. He is homoousios. He is consubstantial. They tried to plan a council for Tarsus, where Paul was from. And this was going to occur in 365. But Valens, the meddler that he was, prohibited it. 
And in the meantime, some of those who had previously reconciled, they broke off communion once again. After that, until about 369, Valens is a little bit preoccupied with wars. You see, there were these uh, Germanic tribes that had been moving westward from Asia, Central Asia-ish. They're being pushed to the frontier of the Roman Empire because other tribes from Asia, the Huns notably, uh, are raiding, they're on a rampage, they're pillaging, and they're pushing the Germanic peoples west. Valens is tied up with these wars against the Gothic tribes. Once the Danubian provinces are secure, so the Danubian provinces, think the Danube River, which flows roughly through Central and Eastern Europe. Once these provinces are secure, Valens can return to meddling. He can go try to play Pope again, right? He supports an unworthy successor to the Patriarchate of Constantinople. This is another example of him trying to get his way in ecclesiastical affairs. And uh, dozens of clerics, I think it was something like seven dozen clerics, protested this. And so, being the nice man that he was, he orders them to be sent out on a ship at sea, and then he had his minions light the boat on fire. And he left them there to their own devices. And again, I mentioned before, he tries to force acceptance of what's called a minimalist creed. That is, what's the least common, the lowest common denominator that we can all agree on. Valens thought that it was homoios, like. The son is like the father. So he's trying to overturn Nicaea. He's got many bishops on his side. But not enough. With things this bad, in the east, our hero dies. Athanasius. Kaput. 373. God had raised him up to defeat the Arian heresy, the Pneumato-Machaeans, Apollinaris, the bishop of Laodicea. But he died. But God doesn't abandon his church. He raised up three more saints in his place. These are the Cappadocian fathers. I'm speaking of Basil of Caesarea, Gregory of Nyssa, his brother, and their mutual friend, Gregory Nazianzen. They were very orthodox. They were Nicenes, and they withstood semi-Arianism after the council. Let's start with Basil. Basil was born in 330. He was a very able bishop. He was a statesman, right? He had spent some time as a monk before he was be, uh, appointed bishop of Caesarea in Cappadocia, not in Palestine. Uh, so says the Caesarea in the Bible that we read about is different from Cappadocian Caesarea. This is where Basil was from. To my knowledge, Basil is the first one to really push uh, for a distinction between usia or nature, and hypostasis, person, right? Before, these terms were sort of flexible, and this was causing some issues between the Greeks and the Latins when they would try to do discourses on theology. Basil says, look, we need to hammer out some terms here. We need usia to just mean nature. Let's have hypostasis just mean person. Let's distinguish these. Let's kind of lock them in to their meanings, their new meanings, and then we'll all know what the other ones are talking about. See, Basil understood usia, nature, to mean one act of existence. And he understood hypostasis to mean an individual mode or manner of existence. Now, he was no modalist. Don't be confused by my language. Basil was orthodox. But he wants to separate these terms and use them fruitfully to reconcile those who are on the subordinationist side or the monarchian side, who really mean the same thing, but are concerned with the opposite extremes of heresy. As with Athanasius, 
Basil of Caesarea did not refer to the Holy Spirit as God. So again, the question kind of lingers. Is this a problem? Is this a stain on his record? We'll see. His brother, Gregory, was born in 335, so he's five years younger, and he was the bishop of Nyssa. He was ordained by Basil, or consecrated by Basil, I should say. Not as capable an administrator, but he was a brilliant philosopher and a theologian. He probably surpasses Basil and Gregory Nazianzen as the most intelligent of the three. Although, to be fair, he does have his own errors. He was very much um, a Neoplatonist, and he was heavily influenced by Origen, the theologian from the third century. Origen was a brilliant man himself, but some of his uh, theologizing led him into places that the church would later condemn. Gregory was deposed from his see by Valens. Arian sympathizers had convinced Valens that this guy needs to go. In 378, after the death of Valens, Gregory returns. He speaks of the doctrine of the Trinity more clearly than Basil, but still somewhat fell short due to the limitations of human language. I, I think I mentioned that in our first episode, that we can only get so far speaking about the truth. Not because what we're saying is untrue by any means, but because we're finite, we're limited, and, and as such, our language is limited. Some things are ineffable. Basil's black mark, Basil's stain, is that he, uh, I mentioned he heavily relied on origin as an influence. Origin believed in what's called apokatastasis, uh, which is like the final restoration of all things. And so, to put it briefly, Basil inherited this idea that at the end of time, at the end of the world, all things would be returned in Christ. In other words, there would be no hell. Everybody would be saved. Right? I'm not sure if Basil went that extra step, but I know for sure that he did believe in this apokatastasis. The third of the three Cappadocians was Gregory of Nazianzus, or Gregory Nazianzen, friend of Basil and Gregory. He was consecrated the bishop of Zazima. Basil convinced him, I need you to be bishop. Zazima was a suffragan see to Caesarea. And Basil wanted to make sure that people he could trust, who he knew were orthodox, were occupying these sees. So he convinces Gregory Nazianzen to become the bishop of Zazima. Gregory didn't want to do it. And as a matter of fact, he never even went to the town. He lived in and around Constantinople. Gregory was sent by Basil to Constantinople to preach Nicene Orthodoxy. So here we have a pious and holy man, Basil, who kind of twists the arm of his friend, Gregory, and says, I need you to be bishop of this town over here. And Zazima apparently was sort of in the backwoods, you know, sort of out in the rural areas, and it was a podunk town, and nobody really wants to be there anyway. He's like, yeah, yeah, um, come on, Gregory, I need you to be bishop over here in Zazima, but really what I need is for you to go to Constantinople, because we're not sure if the people there really have the faith. They need a preacher, and you're him. So Basil sent him. Gregory sets up a small chapel near the palace, and he calls it Anastasia, Resurrection. He eventually drew large crowds. He was quite the orator. Now, when the bishop of Constantinople died, Gregory was installed in his place. To Gregory's credit, despite the intrigue that he got caught up in, he did not shy away from referring to the Holy Spirit as God. Feather in his cap. He believed he was fully consubstantial with the Son and the Father, fully divine, true God, capital G. 
This brings us to about the year 377. In that year, Damasus is Pope. Liberius had died. Damasus is now the successor of Peter. And he plans a Roman synod uh, in 377 to address the errors of the Macedonians and Apollinaris of Laodicea. Both of these groups, uh, well, Apollinaris personally, and the Macedonians as a group, were condemned as heretical. Apollinarianism was spoken of, this is interesting, as being akin to Arianism, even though Apollinaris rejected Arian theology. He believed in the full divinity of the word. But Damasus noticed something. He says, well, it's near Arianism because Apollinaris says that Christ was nearly human, but not really human. Just like Arius says that Christ is nearly God, but not really God. Hmm. And regarding the Macedonians, the Pneumatomachians, the spirit fighters, Damasus says, quote, We do not separate the Holy Spirit. But together with the Father and the Son, offer him a joint worship as complete in everything, in power, in honor, majesty, and Godhead. They almost called the Holy Spirit God. That was pretty good. Roman Synod of 377. So close. All right. Back to the emperors. So we have Valentinian and Valens, brothers. Valentinian, tolerant pretty chill. He's in the West. Valens, Scooby-Doo meddler. He's in the East. Uh, and he favored the Arians too, by the way. Valentinian died in 375, and a fellow named Gratian took his place in the West. Gratian was an associate of St. Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan. Ambrose tutored him, brought him up, sort of uh, groomed him, you might say, to impose Nicene Orthodoxy on recalcitrant Arian clergy. He used the rule of law for the domination of correct doctrine. Shoes on the other foot. And it's tempting for me to say, yes, good, do that more. But then I remember all the instances where it went the other direction. And so I kind of hesitate. Valens, around this time, uh, became engaged in another war against the Gothic peoples. So he was dealing with them between 365 and 369. And here we are, mid-370s. And the problem is cropped up again. Again, the Huns. They're raiding. They're coming from Central Asia. They're pushing the Germanic tribes to the west. And the Goths are seeking refuge within the borders of the Roman Empire. Naturally, Romans didn't like this. They mistreated them. Right? They took advantage of them. They knew they didn't speak the language. They knew they were in a tight spot. They're nomads at this point. They have no land. They probably have few uh, livestock. And so the Romans, they, they sort of... Uh, I think the term I read was mulcted, right? That's fancy. That means they mistreated them, they took advantage of them. Naturally, this caused conflict. And Valens sought to put down this conflict militarily. In 378, at the Battle of Adrianople, Valens was killed. His body was never recovered. He was hostile to orthodoxy. And so, just like with Arius, and just like with Julian the Apostate, I wonder, is this something more than circumstance? Is this something more than human judgment at work here? Upon the death of Valens, Gratian, the emperor in the West, sends Theodosius, a Spaniard, Orthodox Spaniard, to be the emperor in the East. He was a general, he was quite capable, and he was fully Nicene. He quelled the Gothic uprising, 
He made peace in the Danubian provinces. And he too, like Gratian, under the watchful eye of Ambrose of Milan, used the rule of law to impose Nicene Orthodoxy. Anyone who was identified as an Arian heretic, they were excommunicated, probably exiled, and their churches were shut down. You couldn't go there anymore. This brings us to the First Council of Constantinople. Some say it's the unecumenical council because pretty much only bishops from the east were there. There were about 150 of them there. Actually, I take that back. At the first, there were 186 bishops present. 36 Macedonian bishops attended. But when they realized things weren't going to go their way, they took off. And then there was one guy from the west. I don't know his name. But I believe he was there on accident. He shows up and they're like, oh, you're here for the council? And he's like, council? What council? So there's mostly bishops from the east. And it begins under the presidency of Miletius of Antioch. This is the bishop who is in schism. He's the one who hesitated to have communion with Athanasius whom then was rejected by Athanasius in favor of Paulinus, the old Nicene bishop. So Constantinople I begins and is being run by a schismatic. But he died within a matter of weeks. And so the natural candidate is the new bishop of Constantinople, a certain Gregory of Nazianzus. He was made president after Miletius. In the interim, the papal legates arrive. They had instructions from Pope Damasus to crack down on bishops transferring from see to see, S-E-E. -E. And some of Gregory's political opponents used this to their advantage. They said, weren't you the bishop of Sazima? How is it that you became the Bishop of Constantinople? Hmm, seems like the Council of Nicaea prohibited that. Yeah, let's check canon law. Well, yeah, here it is right here. You're not allowed to do that. Gregory, defeated, retires. He leaves. He says, fine, forget it. I'm out of here. I'm not Bishop of Constantinople anymore. But I'm not going to Zazima. He never went. He never went. During Constantinople I, during the council itself, Arianism is condemned again. So are three other heresies. Eunomianism, which we really didn't cover. It was sort of small potatoes. Apollinarianism, that's, uh, remember, the proto-monophysite heresy. Apollinaris said Christ is the word with human flesh only, no human soul, no mind, no will. So it's the Eunomians are denounced, condemned. The Apollinarians are denounced and condemned. And the Pneumatomachians, the spirit fighters, denounced and condemned. The council produced a creed. This is the creed we all know. It used Nicaea's Creed as the foundation. It added the language about the Holy Spirit. But if you notice, say it in your head, it doesn't call the Holy Spirit God. About Christ, when, when it's speaking about Christ, we have true God from true God, right? We've got uh, consubstantial. What do we have for the Holy Spirit? He's Lord. Okay, pretty good. Giver of life. Pretty good. All right? Proceeds from the Father. Uh, and the Son is not in the creed at this point. So we've got he's, he's Lord, he's life giver, he proceeds from the Father, um, he receives glory and honor with the Father and the Son. So we're kind of beating around the bush here. We know what we mean. Why can't we just say it? Again, out of deference for pious custom, or you might even say tradition, the Holy Spirit was not referred to as God. There was a line added as well 
to thwart Marcellus of Ancyra. Marcellus, if you recall from last episode, he believed that at the end of time, the Spirit and the Son would sort of collapse back into the Father, that the only reason they were distinct initially was for creation, redemption, and sanctification. And so those being accomplished, then God is just one. Marcellus was a Sibelian, a modalist. One person, in other words, in the Godhead. And so there's a line in the Creed where it speaks about the reign of Christ will never end. Marcellus of Ancyra believed that it would. And so adding that um, his reign will never end refutes Marcellus. So I guess we can add him to the list. And now we have five heresies or heretics who were condemned. Canons were drawn up as well. But I should note, they were not accepted by the West for quite some time. Only about 900 years. No big deal. Could you imagine that? If the canons from our councils less than 900 years ago remained in limbo, or just so their, their status was ambiguous or something like that. Well, you know, the Pope, he's read them. He's not sure. Uh, I know it's been six centuries, but, you know, he's still not sure. I digress. Constantinople uh, itself, as a council, was not recognized as ecumenical until the 6th century. That's the 500s. I think we have gone as far as we can go today. I think I better stop here. We're going to take a little break. We're going to enjoy the rest of Advent and Christmas with our families. We're going to pick it up again soon. I'll be working behind the scenes with Jeremiah to make sure things are nice and smooth. This is part three of who knows how many on the ecumenical councils. We finally made it to Constantinople one. Coming up, part four, five, six, and so on. We will look at the aftermath of Constantinople I, the lead up to Ephesus, the aftermath, Chalcedon, and so on, and so on. I had a good time. I had a little coffee with me today. Oh, check this out. Don't forget to join the Wolfpack chat on Telegram. You could be a part of the Glad Trad revolution. Join the Glad Trad super friends. Uh, Kaiser in the forefront right here. All right, y'all. I had a very good time. I wish you the best. Never give up, keep on smiling, and memento mori. God bless you, and good night. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. I hope you loved that, by the way. I hope you loved that. I know I did. And I had to put this thing on. I had to. Look at it. Let's get it in there. All the way. Can I get it on? Yeah. <laughs> I was told in the comments section, you got to have the sombrero, man. You got to wear the sombrero. And I'm thinking, why didn't I think of that? We, this is the 200 Wolves episode. We're totally rocking this out. We're partying. And that right there, by the way, is the alarm system. That is the Paleocrat Diaries alert system, which means the conch is out. The didgeridoos are out. The shofars are being blasted left and right to the four corners of the earth. And why? Because we're about to enter the octagon of history. In fact, I think we've already been there for what? The last 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little late on that. I'm a little late on that. But here's the thing. We're, we are going to be concluding, wrapping up our 10 part series on Father Lassance. Father Lassance is his guide for young girls, his guide for young boys. We have transformed those into lessons that we can learn and that we can apply throughout the entirety of our lives. Doesn't matter if you're young, middle-aged, old, doesn't matter, okay? We are going to apply those things. We are going, we, we've gone through how many different topics, by the way? How many different topics have we gone through? It's been amazing. Talking about apologetics, talking about masculinity, femininity, talking about parenting, talking about marriage, talking about purity, talking about fleeing from sin, and today, wrapping it all up, is saying, where do we go from here? Where do we go? What do we do? Once we've learned these lessons, how do we apply them? And he says, you got to do it on your knees. You got to do it on your knees, praying out, crying out to God to discern that vocation. Why did God make you? Why did he equip you with those gifts and talents? 
What is he calling you to in your life? Because if you get off the mark with that, you're gonna be in some big trouble. You are gonna be in some big trouble. So you gotta do it right. It's an urgent matter. And we're making it the grand finale right here on Paleo Crad Diaries. Once it's all done, we'll wrap it up. Okay, we'll wrap it up and we will put together a playlist just like we'll do with enthusiasm so that you can get all of the series in one place. It'll be over at meaningofcatholic.com, by the way. It'll be over at meaningofcatholic.com. <laughs> That's for you, White Wolf. <clears throat> that is for you, White Wolf. I hope that you enjoyed that. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. Oh, buddy. So, okay, look. Before we do that, I, I want to I stress something real quick. Okay, and, and that is that one of the things, you know, we had, we had many great landmarks, didn't we, in the past year? Many. One of those, of course, was entering the fray here at Meaning of Catholic. Just, just starting out, just Paleocrat Diaries. Eventually, it turned into, hey, Jeremiah, you want to join the gang on Mondays at Terror of Demons? Of course. Then it turned into, hey, Jeremiah, maybe we can do this kind of, you know, patrons-only show for uh, Tim and Jerry. And I didn't necessarily like the name. <laughs> and we're calling him Timmy now. He's Timmy. If I'm Jerry, it's Timmy. <laughs> yeah. So, but the thing is, it turned into that. And then it went to reason and theology. That we were going to now be, be uh, broadcasting over there as well. And the idea was, well, let's go ahead and make it a little bit different. There will be a different series. I've been talking about Secular Age. Okay, it's a book. Big, big, huge book. And I'm actually using a summation of that in a book called How Not to Be Secular. And we've been going through that. Here's the problem, is that it's been once a week. And that was an issue, remember, when we started here, only doing one day a week and going through enthusiasm. I was like, this is going to take 20 weeks. And I said, no way. We've got a double time. We've got a double time. I got to reach out to Lofton to confirm that this would be okay. But the goal is that I would be two days a week over there. So you'd have Monday mornings, Terror Demons. You'd have Monday, Reason and Theology at 11. You'd have Wednesday, you'd have that at 11 on, on Meaning of Catholic. Friday, Meaning of Catholic. And then we would have to figure out, are we going to put it on Tuesday? Are we going to put it on Thursday? What, what do we want to do? On a Saturday? I don't even care if we do it on Saturday. But figuring out another day. But that will, that will bump us up to four days in the week. Altogether, five shows and the variable being sometimes six shows okay depending on the patron only thing right because it was it's fortnightly for the most part and that's not even including all of the stuff we do over at the wolfpack chat videos things that we share clips and highlights and all that stuff and you're going to see a lot more of that but I, I i want to connect the people because you have like this crazy thing happen these little silos right so you have meaning of catholics got a certain brand a certain style and a certain silo so people are within that bubble you have some crossover, and you can see that with the wolves. The wolves show up, and they're like, there's wolves all over the place. But, but same thing with reason and theology. There's a bunch of people over there. In fact, that's how we got to the 200 mark, is some people started realizing, oh, my gosh, I'm over at the reason and theology uh, telegram channel. Okay, I'm over there, and I didn't even realize that Jeremiah not only is in here, but he's the one who created it for Michael Lofton. And that Jeremiah pre-exists that <laughs> over with the Wolfpack chat that's this, like, you know, it's this megazord of awesomeness over there, right? Amazing stuff. You're connecting different channels and groups and resources and prayer and book clubs and spiritual advice and all of that all over there. And so they came in, but it's still taking time for those two things to combine so that it's just simply, this is Paleocrat Diaries and I'm on two different places, but there, there's a continuity there. So in an effort to do this, in my first effort to say, look, we need to, to bind those things together. In fact, you may have seen that at the intro when the music boom, pops up at the very beginning. It used to just have a uh, meaning of Catholic symbol. And when I was on Reason and Theology, it had that. Now it has both of them coming at the screen. And we're going to have to just add more and more. <laughs> the more that we find ourselves on other channels, that's what we're going to find. Okay. But the thing is, I want to, I, I wanted to have that bridge that says, look, it's the same show. It's the same host, the same show. We're talking different. We're ju it's just another book to the collection. By the, end of, by the end of it all, right, when I finally give up the ghost, <laughs> right, when I die, I'm hoping to have a treasure trove of series dedicated to books that have transformed my life, transformed my mind, and that I believe uh, are classic. They are books that are 
in, in the canon of Catholic and Western literature and that people can benefit those for a long time to come, right? And so we want to put together our own little library of this. And so those books over there, it will be part of the exact same library. It just happens to be a different channel. And I want to bring those together. And in an effort to do that, I'm going to real quickly, I'm going to show you a quick video. Um, let me let me see if I've, I've got it. It might have to go to part two. Hold on a second. Boop. I'm going to go ahead and do that. So this is a quick video here. I talk, I've talked about apologetics. In fact, that's how the, the Father Lassant series started. It was on purity and apologetics. And I've done multiple episodes talking about advancing this idea of, and I did, I did it before with the new re-evangelization. I talked about the Salesian method. And, and I break that down. I, I broke it down on an episode, on Monday's episode at Reason and Theology. I, I meant to talk about secular age. The entire episode ended up discussing apologetics. That's all it was, is apologetics, my method, what I talk about when I'm describing my method of apologetics that I use and, and breaking it down and answering some of the criticisms and some of the responses to it. So that entire episode is dedicated to it. But it, it, was, it started with a video that I made in 2007. And that video is called Atheist Tag You're Out. And so I want to share that video here. And if you want to know more about an, my answering objections to the method that I use in, in these kinds of videos and the emphasis I place on worldviews, on presuppositions and things like that, you can go and check out the, the video that I made on Monday and watch that. It's about altogether, I think, over an hour of discussing it, breaking it down bit by bit by bit, showing precedence for it within the Catholic Church, within various apologists, and saying that even if they had not formalized it, a couple of them, including St. Francis de Sales and Ronald Knox, in my belief that they, they anticipated a day where this kind of a thing, an emphasis on authority and by what standard, at the most basic level, first things first level, that they anticipated it. And one could even go so far as to say that Knox, in a very curious way, at the end of his life, in a book he never finished, that he kind of prophesied that that day would come. And I think that that's, what, that's one of those things that we have here. And it also gives me a chance. My kids just got home. They had half day. <laughs> so pray for them. It's finals. But here we go. Here's this video. And then we're going to get into the, the grand finale where we talk about Father Lassant's and the directions that he gives people when discerning their vocation. So we're going to talk about that, whether it's marriage, whether it's religious life, uh, you know, being um, a bachelor for life, right? A bachelorette for life that you just simply you're not getting married. You may be uh, not necessarily going to the convent or the monastery, but you don't believe that you're called to marriage or that you'd be called to marriage. And he gives basic directions for that. I'm going to limit that to end at a certain part to allow the, the purchase of the book to have more meaning because he gives more specific directions to each individual vocation that he talks about. And that can be found either by buying the book or by checking out the PDF at the Wolfpack Resources. But even if you do that, I strongly encourage you to get the book. You'll carry it with you for your life. So with no further ado, here's the video I made in 2007 that breaks down my reasons for using a number of phrases that you've heard throughout this entire series and that you've heard throughout the series on, even with Jansenism in that uh, portion of the Enthusiasm series, as well as Secular Age. So with no further ado, Atheist, tag your out. Let's begin first and foremost here by dealing with what is a presupposition? What's a worldview? A presupposition, okay, insofar as this is concerned in this context, what I mean by that is our most basic and fundamental beliefs. Presuppositions determine what we will accept as evidence, uh, as well as how we will interpret that evidence. Okay, so these are, these are awfully important. Uh, it is at this level that we evaluate those arguments that we give one another. These are the most foundational things by which we evaluate evidences, and we evaluate what we see, and our ideas about man and all that. A worldview is simply networking those things together into a comprehensive unit. That's all that is. Okay, that's why it's a worldview. It, it, it encompasses what you believe about man, what you believe about reality, and it is through this lens that you evaluate everything. That's, that's why it's called presuppositions. Okay, you presuppose these things before you even look at the evidence. Okay, that's how we interpret those things. Two things need to be said. One, we can't just say that it's axiomatic. We can't just say, oh, well, these are our presuppositions, and I just assume them, and I don't have to prove them. Uh, that is begging the question. 
Okay, and this is extraordinarily problematic when the, when the espoused presuppositions that you hold to would make impossible the very things you're trying to do. For example, if your espoused presuppositions can't account for the possibility of evidence or the possibility of knowledge, then for you to want to bring evidence and knowledge to the table is, is problematic at best. You can't hold presuppositions that militate against the very thing you're using without trying to explain or justify your presuppositions and show how these things are consistent. There are three areas that I want to deal with. Uh, one is the one and the many, and a lot. this is an issue that not many people are aware of, but it, and especially the importance of it. The other one is the uniformity of nature, and lastly will be inductive reasoning. And all through the history of man, people have tried to figure out how we're able to have generalizations and yet also have particulars. Okay, are we going to, you know, is everything one or is everything radically different? Is, are, are, are we uh, one united thing or are we completely diverse? And it's my position that the Christian worldview and it alone can account for this through the concrete universal that we know as the Trinity or the ontological Trinity. The ontological Trinity, uh, what that does is you have the one and the many. You have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You have the, the diversity and yet they are one God at the exact same time. Um, the, the three are equally ultimate. Okay? The oneness and the diversity are equally ultimate. And this is key. There are no particulars that aren't related to the universal. And there are no universals that aren't related to the particulars. Now, someone can ask and say, well, okay, we'll grant that you believe in a trinity. But what does that have to do with the temporal order? Because we have a creator who's both one and many, at the same time, equally ultimate in both. Okay, and he's created the world in such a fashion, it reflects and, and exemplifies his nature. If we say that nature will exemplify the metaphysical, we would have no problem uh, with the one and the many here, because we have the concrete universal by which these make sense. This is absolutely central to knowledge, because it's at this level where we are able to generalize and where we are able to look at something as particular. The second piece is induction. Um, induction, uh, for our sake here, will be the method of generalizing from observed cases to all cases of the same kind. David Hume would have argued that each and every premise, every bit of reasoning about any single event or situation at a particular time in a particular place would need to be individually confirmed empirically. According to Hume, there is no way that that person would be able to go and say, well, okay, I'm going to put my hand in fire here, and then I'm going to go to the future and do the exact same thing over here, and you'd have to individually verify it. Now, he understood that people use induction. His question, what he wanted to know, is what are the foundations of this? He said, yeah, we take this for granted, but he wanted to know on what foundation, on what basis do you do that? And that's been my question all along. Bertrand Russell, he had this to say, he said, all arguments which on the basis of experience argue as to the future uh, or the unexperienced parts of the past or present assume the inductive principle. Hence, we can never use experience to prove the inductive principle without begging the question. Let me repeat that last sentence once again. Hence, we can never use experience to prove the inductive principle without begging the question. Well, why is that? Because when you say, well, because it's been that way in the past, you're, you are presuming the inductive principle when doing that. <laughs> okay? You're presuming it the entire time, which begs the question. So you have to ask yourself, does your worldview account for such a thing? Does it? The question is then, how does the Christian, uh, the Christian worldview account for inductive reasoning? And it's pretty much the same as the uniformity of nature, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lump these two in together. So I'm dealing here not only with induction, but I'm dealing with the uniformity of nature. Um, because they, they rely on one another. And it's this, is that we believe not only in a creator God, but this creator God is one of sovereignty, and that he has providence over his created order. He didn't wind us up and let us go. He didn't throw us into a chaotic cosmos. He, he has placed us in an environment by which we are to live, to move, and to have our being. And he's, he has placed us in an environment that, was, that, that, is, that is sustained with the necessary preconditions for life. And one of those necessary preconditions for life and for the purpose that he's placed us here is to have the world function in such a way that it is rather predictable. That I know that tomorrow, unless I die, or unless something radical happens, I'm going to wake up. That I know that when I put the keys in the car, that my keys aren't going to turn into a Gila monster. 
<laughs> if, I, if I am driving towards a semi-truck, like I mentioned before, if I'm driving towards a semi-truck, I have a good reason to believe that if I don't move out of the way, I'm going to be roadkill. Okay? So, so he's placed us in a world where we are able to rely on the basic trustworthiness of what we have around us. And the reason being is because God is a God of providence, He's a God of wisdom and of knowledge, and He's a God of order and design. When push comes to shove, and somebody sits there and they say, well, what is your proof? What is your proof? How do you prove the existence of God? Okay, or how can you prove me wrong? And the answer is really simple. Because the best argument for the existence of God, as I have demonstrated here, and as I've demonstrated in other places, is the impossibility of the contrary. Is that it is absolutely impossible for it to be contrary to the Christian worldview. Every single opposing worldview falls on its own claim. And I didn't mean to, to have that intro in there where it was rock music. <laughs> Please forgive me, Tim Flanders, for that. Um, I, did not, I, I didn't mean to leave that in there. Um, but my point is, and I don't want to go into it too much because you need to go and you need to just watch. I go into great detail talking about responses back because people are so accustomed to just hearing the classical method. They're, they're so accustomed to, to the five proofs. And I say there's a place for that. There's a place for that. But even when we talk to people, like in the comments, somebody said, uh, and by the way, that, that's me in the video, Jeremiah Bannister, okay? So, yeah, that's me when I was younger. I think I was 29. I think I was 29 years old. But the, in, in the video that I just shared. Um, but that's the same guy, right? Um, my point being that when, in the comments, somebody said, you know, well, if somebody says, you know, you're debating with an atheist and they ask you about this and that, you can say, well, what caused the universe? You know, they could say, well, a deistic God or an energy. They could do that. And, I, and I'm not there to defend an energy. I'm not there to defend a, a, a watchmaker, a deistic watchmaker that winds us up and lets us go. I'm not there for that. And I'm not, I'm not wanting to play footsies and say, well, let me gradually do this and this and this and then lead you to a place of probability where you're willing to jump out of the boat. Because when they ask me to, for proof, when they say, I would like to talk to you about your proof, they're presupposing a great number of things. Number one, that I'm not them and that they're not me. Their worldview, does it account for the existence of one and many? Does it? Or is it that all things are one or that all things are many? Where does the ness of life come from? The ness of things. And I say that we can see we're different yet similar. We're able to communicate. They're supposing the... Uh, that, that language is not purely arbitrary, that there's a meaningful um, substance to what we're doing when we communicate to each other, and that we can communicate ideas, and that we can have ideas, and that those are, ideas are in fact our own, and that we have, there's something within us where we can make the decisions to change ideas, that we, we play a role, that we have free will in that sense, and that we can understand reason, that logic exists. And you say, in your materialistic world, how do you account for this? You're demanding logic, but do you, do, does your worldview have the foundations, the, the preconditions that actually are necessary for even that to be possible? Not even true, but possible. And if not, then you're coming in and I'm allowing you and we debate an argument back and forth and go back and forth swashbuckling each other. Behind the scenes are a whole host, an entire ism, an entire worldview that they have beliefs about man, about our being, about metaphysics, Ontology, teleology, epistemology, all of that. And they assume those things quietly. But those things would militate against the very exercise that they're demanding of us. And our view provides for those necessary things. It provides necessary preconditions wherein that even makes sense at all. And so the mere fact that they are engaged in that exercise, the mere fact that they are using inductive reasoning, the mere fact that they believe that they're not a brain in a vat or that everything's a mirage. The mere fact that there's a stability in nature, that they can say, look, my, my keys aren't going to turn into a, a, you know, some kind of crazy lizard all of a sudden. Or, I, you know, I'm driving down the road and my car is going to turn into a banana. Like the mere fact that those, that stability is present. Their worldview, their worldview grapples to try to figure out how can we account for that? It cannot because they lack the ontological trinity. End. Yes, and I was an atheist for many years. And, I, and people wanted me to debate videos of myself arguing against atheism, and I always chalked it up as, oh, yeah, it'd be easy to do. Yeah, yeah, it would be easy to do. But that's just simply not true. 
<laughs> and there's a reason why I never debated myself on that. Yeah. And so those things, and as I said, go back, go back to Mars Hill. Go back to Mars Hill and find out and say, the method that I talk about on this show, what we, what we aim to do when engaging with people in apologetic encounters, when we do that, we are invoking the method of St. Paul at Mars Hill. We are not cloaking it with some fake neutral stance. We are not cloaking what we're doing and, and pretending that we're blank slates or that we're talking to blank slates. We're not doing that. We don't, we're not arguing for the unknown God. That's the God that he went in and said they were superstitious for having it there and said, I'm here to tell you what that God is. And he not only told them, he, he gave the entire story, creation. He talked about where we came from. He talked about what we are. He talked about history, the, the, uh, the idea that there's a meaning behind this. And that even they knew, even their poets spoke of such things. So he, grant, he, he pointed that out. They're without excuse. They're suppressing truth for a lie, fascinated with the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of words. And at the end, he, he brings up and he says that, that God used to wink. The time where God winked at this sort of thing is past. And now people need to do penance. It was, it was a whole enchilada. It was the entire thing. He came with the most with the most unapologetically Catholic apologetic in the world. And that's what it was. And that's what we do here. So all right, we're moving on. If you want to see that whole video, as I said, it's 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 a hour and a half basically, something like that, of just talking about that. Okay. All right. So all right, whither whither goest thou? the decision, right? So uh, Father Lassance, we've been doing this series. We've reached this place where Father Lassance is saying, you, you finally reached a place where you've got to make a decision in your life, right? You, you've been equipped. You've been equipped. You, you've been, been instructed on purity. You've been instructed on masculinity, on femininity, about, about work in the home and outside the home. You've been, you've been instructed in this way. You've been instructed and provided resources in the appendix of the book, which is like half the book, to be honest, of resources that you can enjoy for the rest of your life on that path of salvation and perfection. You've been given all of these things, but now the time has come and you, you've reached that, that place in your life where you have to make a decision. He says, let's suppose you're, walk, you're on a walking tour in a neighborhood as yet unknown to you. You come to a spot where one road leads straight before you, another to the right and a third to the left. Is it not very important for you to know which of these three roads you ought to take in order to reach the desired goal? So you have to do that. Hold on, Hold on a second. My kids got home. <laughs> they're in the other room right there and they're, they're talking with each other in the other room. I'm like, I'm live right now. Boom, 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 beating on the wall. <laughs> Get yourselves under control, you crazy lunatics. <laughs> Weirdos. <laughs> oh, I love my kids. But you have to come to a decision. You have to enter upon one of these three paths. But which, which of these are you to choose? The marriage state, priesthood, or religious life? And I, and I, I love this because people would say, well, wait a second. He's talking about vocations. He's talking about vocations. And yet, for some reason, he's not talking about, well, what about your business? And he's going to talk about this in a moment. It is of the highest importance that you should choose the right way. So this isn't, this isn't a small matter. Why? Right? Because the state of your life, this is something that is destined to you by God. The three states mentioned above, life in the world or matrimony, the priesthood or the religious life are the only vocations properly so called. He said certain doctors and lawyers, tutors, tradesmen, artisans, farmers, and so on, apparently represent so many different vocations to make use of an expression commonly in vogue. But these are really no vocations in the proper sense, for they impose upon those who embrace them no essentially different obligations, as in the states of matrimony, the priesthood, and the religious life. So when people use the term, like I would say, what I do here, this is my vocation. And yet he would say, no, your vocation in your life is actually matrimony. You're married. You have children, right? As I said, they just got done with their their first day of finals, and they're in the other room right now on a half day. Or the priesthood of the religious life. They're simply trades. These are occupations, professions, distinct positions in life. Now, it doesn't mean 
You, you shouldn't take him to mean that, that there's no reason to discern that. I did a novena. I did a novena. I, I came back. I, I fell away from the Lord, fell away from the faith for seven years of my life. I was a militant atheist for seven years. And I came back and it was royally confusing. It was hard. And I'd gone through a lot of things. You know, I, I'd gone through uh, the death of my daughter. I'd gone through the death of my best friend. I'd gone through my parents divorced. And it was, it was, it was sad, a sad ordeal. There was a, a, a whole number of things that I went through. And those seven years of, of falling prey to militant atheism left me all sorts of discombobulated. And even when I came back, there was a, there's a feeling, a right, it's right, it's good to have a feeling that you're not worthy to do anything like what I'm doing right now. And I'm glad that I had the advice that was given to me by my confessor, who he knows me very well. He knew me even before I fell away. He was my confessor before I fell away. And he was concerned for me. He's the one who gave me the book, Enthusiasm. And that was the first book that we dedicated a series to when I came back to being a Catholic. But the thing is, is he said, you got to take that year off. No, no, no videos, no podcasts, no AM, FM radio, no nothing. And he knew that I could do it. I was financially stable enough that I could do that. And so, and he said, in that, in that time, not, no blogs, no nothing, no dialogues or, you know, getting together and sitting on a panel discussion because that's what my life was. And he said, no more. You're not going to just go from that straight over to this. You need to take that time, immerse yourself back in Catholic culture, immerse yourself in the sacraments, immerse yourself at that altar, immerse yourself in prayer, immerse yourself in the Bible, immerse yourself in practicing this out with your entire family and do it for at least a year. I did it for 16 months. And at the end of that 16 months, Tim Flanders, in fact, it was him. You know, he came and we, we'd become friends and he talked to me about this idea. He wanted to promote this, this new thing that he had, a dot com. It was a great idea. And he said, I want you to be a co-owner, man. I want you to come in and we'll do this together, this thing. I sat down with him at his house. That's why it kind of cracks me up when people are like, I don't like the, <laughs> they think they've got Tim's ear on stuff. I don't like this guy on here. He rubs me the wrong way. <laughs> I'm like, you don't know the backstory. You don't know the backstory. You haven't been watching from the beginning either. And so, you know, but to sit there and say, what was that idea? Meaning of Catholic.com. It was meaning of Catholic. His wife had made this uh, a great uh, website. It looked great on a phone. He showed me on his phone how it looked. It was awesome, sleek, nice, simple, black and white. It was great. But even then, I was still, I was still confused. I was, I was so frustrated. I didn't know what I was going to do. I felt unworthy. I, I didn't feel like I could do any of that stuff. And I ended up doing a novena, right? St. Jose Maria Escrava. And I remember that last day, right? The last day of the novena, I, I met this church, St. Stephen's in East Grand Rapids, and I'm there alone. And they, they've got this beautiful, it's like a cross on the floor, right? Leading up to the, uh, the altar, right? And, and I went there and I just laid on it. I just cried. And I said, God, I don't even know what to do. I feel like if I ever want to talk that I'm, I'm just this, I'm a bad person. I was scrupulous, you know, in a way that says it was a legitimate thing. I had done a lot of things wrong. But it was paralyzing and that was wrong. Right? And, and it was one of those things. That's where Paleocrat Diaries was born. Thus does the call of God sound in the ears of all men in innumerably different ways. Okay, so for me, I just gave you my way, the, the way that I came to the conviction that this is what I ought to do, not only with the show, but with writing. One hears the call in his own heart from his childhood days. Another hears it for the first time when the moment of decision arrives. God calls one suddenly by extraordinary event, others again, and the greater number by the force of circumstances and environment. So it's not a one-size-fits-all thing. You're not all going to be Samuel that hears God calling and he's like, here, Lord, here I am. <laughs> you know, you're not going to be that. Not everybody's going to be alone in a church after, after a novena. Not everybody's going to be doing that. God has different ways of reaching you. You're a different person. You've got a different calling. If you are not destined for life in the world, for matrimony, you will scarcely be able to save your soul in a married state. This is why he says it's so important because a lot of people... Look, you know, and you have to imagine that there are people who ought to have been one thing. In fact, that that, in fact, was their calling. God still, in his grace, 
allows people to still do good outside of that. But there will be a struggle there. And it says that person will only succeed in doing so with great difficulty. On the other hand, if you're called to the matrimonial state, to remain unmarried would place a great obstacle, right? It would, in your heavenward way. So it plays an obstacle there. You know, it's one of the things, don't you love it about Catholicism? When I was a Protestant, I knew, I knew people, especially women, but also men, that they were, they, they just in their life, they were pressured to be involved in matrimony, right? That they were, you know, why aren't you married? And they felt a certain pressure about that. But there was something about them as individuals that it's almost like they weren't made for that. But they had no outlet. There was no convent for them. There's no monastery for them. You know, I, I wonder the same thing. What did Carmen, the singer, I wonder about that. You know, I mean, I, that guy, Protestant guy, you know, very handsome dude. Been single his whole life. I'm like, if he was a Catholic, you know, he'd probably be a priest. But it's not even within the, the imaginary for him. It's not an option for him because their system doesn't afford that. But ours does. Ours does. Therefore, St. Gregory of Nazianzen says, he who makes a mistake as to his vocation will fall from one error to another all of his life long, and at the end of it may possibly even find himself deceived as to his hope of heaven. It's a big deal. It's an urgent thing. And that's why so much preparation was put into this. And I, I fear, let me say this, I actually feared for, you know, when I, when I was putting it together, saying, I don't know, should I have a nun, you know, and a, and a priest or something? Should I have them on the show to talk about this? I'm a married man. I can talk about that. But should I have them on the show? And I thought, and I said, you know what? This is a book meant for young people to read by themselves and to be able to speak of these things to their confessors. But you can read it and learn it on your own. In fact, that was the expectation. And I said, so we can talk about it. But it would be an encouragement, in fact, and it's something I've talked about before that I really want to start doing where, where we just, within our day-to-day -day affairs, that we have sisters, right, nuns, that we've got uh, monks, that we go to convents and monasteries, that we begin to go to these places to have priests more regularly in our lives, that our kids, it's not just this isolated thing way out there somewhere that they can't understand and appreciate and get to know those individuals to understand what it means to be that, what it means to be called to that. And that that happens with young people by proximity. It's one of the reasons I'm so grateful that Sacred Heart, both as a parish and as a school, as an academy, that they have sisters there and that those sisters teach and those sisters are involved in the life of the church, praying the hours inside of the sanctuary, being in the church itself, praying the hours and saying, you're welcome to come and join us for this. But fear not. Be of good courage. There is a sure and simple means of choosing a right. In the meantime, be truly chaste and pious, and your choice cannot fail to be a happy one. Because many are the ways, many are the ways that, that here lead unto a higher sphere. One thy God has traced for thee, best and safest, that will be. So be pious, right? It's another one of those instances where, you know, it sounds like such a big task, and it is. It sounds like such a big thing, and it is. A lot is on the line, and yet what is the recommendation? Be pious. Remain pure. Those are simple things. It's almost as if, you know, God made these <laughs> for simple, common people. The vast majority of people on the planet are simple and common. His first piece of advice is take counsel of yourself. Okay, But you must do this calmly and without prejudice. Your heart should resemble a delicately balanced pair of scales. You must weigh all things fairly. Okay, So you have to be able to, to, to be yourself and to say, okay, look, I got I to gotta think this through. I got to think this through. What am I to do? Because you know yourself, but it's insufficient to say just you. He goes here and says, take counsel with yourself in such a manner 
as will enable you to say to God in a spirit of resignation, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. I desire nothing but what is thy will. If only I can do thy will, it is a matter of indifference to me, whether I'm rich or poor, whether happiness or sorrow is my portion, whether my life is full of work or spent in ease and without exertion. All of this is of no consequence if only I can please thee, O oh my God, and save my soul in the end. That's the simplicity of the glad trad. This says, I don't know what my life is, what my life has in store. I don't know where you're going to lead me. Life is this crazy game. I wake up and I don't know what's ahead. I might in fact die today. I might in fact die. I didn't anticipate being born. I opened my eyes and I didn't even realize I had opened my eyes. When I became aware of the fact that I'd opened my eyes, I'd already been walking around day after day for maybe a year. For months. Before there was much like awareness of like, oh my gosh, I'm in a universe with a bunch of people here. This is what I am. But you didn't ask, you know, God, you didn't say, hey, look, I, let's schedule when I'm born here. Let's schedule my, my insertion into the natural order. <laughs> you know? That's a God design. And so we don't know what that, what, 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 just like we didn't know that we were going to come into existence, when we wake up in the morning and face that day, one of the reasons why we got to get on our knees right away is that we have to be able to tell, say to the Lord, look, whatever comes my way, I don't know what's, what's going to happen. I don't know who I'm going to be coming in contact with. There is some continuity. You might have your job, your nine to five, another day, another dollar type person. But yet you don't know who's going to come through that door. You don't know what challenges you're going to face, what sins you might succumb to, which is why you must prepare yourself and remain pious. In this resigned frame of mind, examine yourself, review your characteristics, peculiarities, inclinations, good and bad, Think over your past. Notice what your passions and, tem and temptations are. Consider the strength or weakness of your will. Then compare it with all this, compare with all this the duties, difficulties, and dangers of the state of life upon which you propose to enter. So that th those are some of the mechanisms that you can say, look, this is what I'm good at. This is what I'm not good at. Here's the things that I'm, I'm excited about and that I, 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 there's a zeal within me that I'm excited about this. And, but here's maybe the pitfalls and the, the, the potential to do wrong problems. And in that balance, when you look at that and you take a good examination of yourself, not done in haste over time, that you can look at that and say, if you feel compelled to ask yourself, when I remember the weakness of my will and the force of the temptations which assail me, I don't think that I'm capable of fulfilling the duties of that state or overcoming the difficulties which it presents, it becomes plain that this road to heaven is too steep for you. Consider your case as you would that of a friend who had similar faults and the same inclinations because we're biased toward ourselves. We're going to look at ourselves and we're going to, we're going to uh, kind of push down a lot of the problems that we have and we're going to magnify the good things because it feels good, right? It's, it's preferable. More people would rather feel good about themselves. It's why, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult. Sometimes it takes another person pointing out a problem that we have. And so we have to do this kind of trick that attempts at least to transcend ourselves and to be honest, brutally honest, more honest than ever. One is, one is usually more unprejudiced in regard to others, okay? So that's, it's one of those things. You go, yeah, okay. So, you know, I end up, it's easier for me. It's easier for me to, to come against another person and say what their issue is than if I'm considering something of a personal nature. Act in respect to yourself as you will wish you had done when you had come to lie upon your deathbed. We've talked about that, haven't we? That if you want, if you want to do the right thing, Keep keep death before your eyes always. Momentum mori. It's one of the reasons why we say that at the beginning and the end of every show. When we salute each other at the end, never give up. Keep on smiling and remember that you too and me, that one day we too shall die. Because if we do that and we keep that in, in sight and we don't know when that day will come, right? That that will keep us on guard. So he says, imagine that you're on your deathbed 
There can be no safer rule than this. For in the presence of death, matters are viewed in their true light, and they're no longer seen through colored glass. My second piece of advice is this. Take counsel with other people. But who's to counsel you and to whom ought you to listen? Great caution is necessary. There are counselors who present themselves uh, unasked and to whom it would be wrong to listen. On no account, lend your ear to bad Catholics. (laughs) So don't even talk to them. He says, look, there's bad Catholics. You don't want to talk to them, to persons who have no faith or have not a good reputation. So you want to, you want to present yourself and what you're talking about. You want to be, you want to be selective about your counsel. You don't want to just say, well, you know, I, I need to, I need to talk to just anybody. Oh yeah, was, you know, this person over here is my, my buddy. Might be your buddy, but not, might not be the best person to be a counselor for you. May, might not even be necessarily the best guy to have as your buddy. There are yet other counselors to whom it would be most inadvisable to listen. Worldly persons who are entirely absorbed in material things. And think of why, right? Think of why. How many saints do you, you know, if you've read Lives of Saints and stuff, how many different saints... You know, St. Alphonsus is one of these who wanted to go into the priesthood and the family, man. I mean, it was like rough. They wanted children. There was a legacy there. There was a name. And that's a natural That's a natural thing. Most, most parents, the idea of not having grandchildren and watching their name go away, there's something godly within them that would like to see that continue. That's why procreation and marriage is so important. But yet it can go too far by making central what's not central. Nor ought you listen to the advice of those who have anything to gain or lose from your choice as regards the goods of this world. Finally, do not be advised by persons who know nothing about the state of life that you may be thinking of adopting as, for instance, the religious state. Their ignorance imbues them with the most absurd ideas and vehement prejudices in regard to such a state of life. How could they form a correct opinion? (laughs) How How could you form that? So you got somebody, you know, they, that's kind of commonsensical, isn't it? But I can imagine a lot of people saying, well, yeah, I'm thinking about doing this and they, because they want people to know. So they go and they think, well, I, I should just say it. I'm in a group of guys who have no, no concept of, of hierarchy, no concept of the religious state, no concept of any of this. And they just want to get it out because they want to talk to somebody. Another reason why we should do better about learning, you know, where are, where are the different religious orders? We have redemptorists in our town. I want to get to know them better. I want my kids to get to know them better. A first name basis. I, we, we, have, we have nuns around here, different convents. I want to start spending more time out there. We have sisters in the church. I want to spend more, spend more time around them so that not only they become familiar, but that they can see the strengths and weaknesses of my children as well. And that they'd be counselors that they could go and not feel like, well, I, I don't really know much about you, but that they could help guide them. For whom then are you to seek counsel? Keep continually to a wise man who fears the Lord. And why is it so? Because the person who desires to give good advice must often offend this or that individual with regard to whose temporal interest the result of his advice may prove to be prejudicial. I know someone who made a bad mistake, made bad mistakes, did not take the advice of multiple counselors and has found himself in a very terrible position. It's tragic. As a rule, your natural advisors given you by God are your parents. However, there are exceptional cases in which they rank among the evil counselors that I've enumerated above. Under all circumstances, your best advisor is plainly your confessor. You ought not only to ask his advice, but faithfully to follow it. Who knows you? He knows you, and he knows you as no one can know you except God alone. He knows your good and your bad qualities and your inclinations. Therefore, do not, in your youthful folly, be influenced by the fear that his advice will not coincide with your own wishes. Isn't that tough? Isn't that tough? Because how many times have you said, man, I'm I'm scared to go to confession? 
I'm scared to go to confession. You know, I, I made a video of my, my fear, uh, my fear, loathing, and love of confession. And I talked about various kinds of confession, you know, confessing things to friends, confessing things to, uh, in general, like about yourself, confessing to yourself things about you that you may kind of want to press down and <laughs> not, not to make obvious even to yourself, self-deception, but also confession, right, in the, in the old box there with the priest. I talked about it. In fact, it's a, a, a powerful video. It's, you can find it over on the uh, Paleocrat YouTube channel. Therefore not, okay, in your youthful folly, don't be, don't be influenced by the fear that this advice is not going to coincide with your own. Rather, give thanks to God that you have at least one friend whose intentions are pure, whose motives are disinterested, and who will be able to prevent you from taking a false step. And he says, so what do you do in the meantime? We already mentioned one. You keep your heart constantly directed toward heaven. Have but one desire, namely to know and to do the will of God. So if you, if you sit there and you say, well, what do I do in the meantime, right? What do I do in the meantime? I, I, I'm not of an age or I'm not at that place or whatever. Um, you know, and he actually says mid-20s. And this is, this is old school. It's early 1900s. So, I mean, you know, he's, he's a lot of people would say, well, be 18 years old or whatever. He says that a lot of times, especially with the marriage state for men, particularly in their mid twenties, no one ought to wait for an extraordinary call, such as the apostles had, right? However, if you keep your heart constantly directed toward God, He will enlighten you with His grace. He will give you prudent counselors, and so or ordain external circumstances that you may be led, as if by the hand of your guardian angel, to the state of life that God intends. For you. So you have to put yourself in that place. You have to put yourself in that place, that, that, that sacred space, that mental space, where you are able to say, look, Lord, I don't know how these circumstances are going to play out, but I'm leaving myself in your hands, and I'm trying every day to do your will. And in doing this, I have to believe that you will provide the circumstances necessary for my life to make the wisest decision that I can make regarding what I'm going to do with the remainder and wholeness of who I am. In the second place, keep your soul pure. Very much everything indeed depends on this. The brighter and more transparent is the glass of a window, the more readily do the rays of the sun penetrate into the room. But the dimmer the glass, the darker will the apartment be. So he's saying, you know, something simple. He's saying, look, you got you to stay pure. You got to stay good. You got to stay on top of the game. You got to stay on the ball. Because if you don't, that sin is not just going to sever you in a way that you got to go to confession, but it can make it such that you're not seeing things rightly. He talked about that earlier. He talked about, what was it, the telescope and about making sure that it was clean. And we talked about that in an earlier episode. And so he's using that similar language again about the glass and about light coming through. And so if, if, if you have that sin, maybe that sin is leading you to places where those, those individuals that you need to be around that can give you that solid advice, maybe you're not there because the sin has led you somewhere else or the sin has, has shaded your mind and, and your heart in such a way, it's darkened it in such a way that you're, you don't even realize necessarily that you're kind of groping around in darkness. And that's not the ideal place for you to be able to make this decision. In the third place, be diligent in prayer. I think it's one of the great benefits of saying that the wolf pack is a wolf pack of prayer. What we do, that we are nothing if not that. Because prayer is of the utmost importance in choosing a state of life. There are two epochs in the life of every individual when the devil lays snares for him with particular cunning. The first, when he ceases to be a child. Then comes the crisis, the critical period, when the result of previous training will show in the innocence and purity of the youth or maiden, or the reverse, be unhappily the case. So, so we already know, right? There's phases in our life. And if we didn't start off right, we got extra work ahead. It's kind of like if you're not doing good in your school year and you're through the first semester, the first term, and your teachers say, look, your grades ain't too hot, you're going to have to do way better work if you're building up 
look, if you've set that those standards and you've set those behaviors and patterns of behavior, then you're and, and you've done a successful job at it, even if there's been mistakes here here and there, but you've done an overall exceptional job about it, that's a foundation whereupon you can build up. And it and it instills those patterns of behavior that make it easier to move forward. Same thing here. But yet with greater cunning and force of will, the devil attacks you, either now or in a few years hence, when you come to choose a state in life. Only two more frames here. In the fourth place, receive frequently and worthily the sacraments of penance and of the altar. To strengthen you to make any sacrifice that might be necessary. The altar, confession. Say, look, whatever the sacrifice is, because these are big things, no matter which way you go. No matter which way you go. If you're meant for marriage, if you're meant for the priesthood, if you're meant for the religious life, no matter what you choose in your life, that is going to be a daunting task on you. Demanding. To the nth degree, right? You are going to need to put everything you've got into that. You might not. There will be, that'll wax and wane. There's an ebb and flow of that, right? We're human. Seasons come, seasons go. Sometimes we're lethargic. Sometimes we're on fire, right? We're rocking it out. But it demands a stable hand. It demands, it demands a kind of stable genius, actually, <laughs> to say, you know, that you're going to, you're going to realize not only what you're getting into, but what it demands of you. And you should take it seriously before you even get to that place of making the decision. It's just like going to school. How many students do you know, if you went to college, how many students do you know that took remedial courses because they weren't prepared? How many students do you know that end up leaving college because they can't do the work? They don't, and even, maybe they know the topic, but the amount of time that they have to dedicate in their day, they're not disciplined enough because they never built up to that. It's one of the reasons I love Sacred Heart. It's one of the reasons why every penny that comes into the show goes toward my kids' education there because they're looking from the end backward and saying, where do they need to be? How do we build that up over time to instill those habits of the heart and mind, your day-to-day -day life, the patterns of behavior inside and outside the room that will make you excellent at what you're going to do? To infuse that and to, to, uh, to um, push you toward a life of virtue because you have sacrifices to make. Imagine that you're stretched upon your deathbed. Once again, there he goes. Ask yourself if you were in that awful hour, what state of life you would wish you had chosen. He says, I cannot refrain from mentioning one more means for arriving at a right decision. Namely, a true filial, confiding love and devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. If you desire wisdom and enlightenment concerning the choice of a state of life, the surest way is to obtain it through Mary. She's the great seat of wisdom. A true servant of Mary can never be lost. And so, what, you know, what is your devotion in that way? Build that up. Familiarize yourself. Join that wolf pack, the, the wolf pack prayer chat. Go join that, the prayer chain. Because we do litanies. We do novenas. We do rosaries and chaplets all the time. You want to you really build that up? You want to build up that relationship? A true filial, confiding love and devotion to Our Lady? Head over. We're all on board. <laughs> We're all doing it. And he ends by saying, Do not imagine that thoughts like these are suited only for a young man who is about to enter the cloister. As you ought to beware... Right? As you ought to beware of rashness in choosing a state of life, so ought you to guard against over anxiety. Do not lose heart in the presence of the momentous decision. It'd be easy to do. But make use of the means I've pointed out to you. Go back. Go back and when this episode's over, this is this is the, the final, this is the cherry on top here for this series. Go back and, and, and listen to his advisements. Listen. Think for yourself about them. Think for yourself how these lessons and advisements apply to your life, 
to make you true living epistles in a world that's gone real bad. And realizing that it's not just your day-to-day, but there's a big vision ahead. Dream bigger thoughts. We say that all the time. Dream bigger thoughts. That's your vocation, by the way. It's your vocation. I'd say big V and little V, you know? It's not only these, these three vocations that he talks about, but also whatever it is that you do in your life, that you dream bigger thoughts about that, that you apply the truths that you have learned through, through saintly wisdom, that you apply those truths in such a way that you become robustly, holistically Catholic in a whole manner, right? Make use of the means I've pointed out to you. Look constantly toward heaven. Keep your soul pure, diligent in prayer. Frequently approach the sacraments. Practice devotion to Mary. Regard her as your mother. And look with cheerful confidence into the future. Look, for cheer- look with cheerful confidence. That's hard to do, isn't it? In fact, that's been one of the themes, I think, of the show, is that in 2021, it was a major theme that we live in a world that's gone wicked bad. The world believes you're mad. The world believes you're crazy. And in many ways, a lot of Catholic people, even amongst traditionalists and sometimes especially, act extremely mad and sad and bad. But we have a reason to be cheerful. We have a reason to have a confidence in facing the future, even if it's the end, all the more. But we have a reason to. In fact, we have, we have myriad reasons to, to say we can look at that. And I know not only that he's within me, but that he's without and that I can press forward, that I can learn lessons here and lessons there. I can apply them to my life. If I make a mistake, I can get back up. I can throw myself at the cross again and again and again and do what I must on this long, lifelong path of salvation and perfection. I can do it because he's drawing me to himself And he's brought something within me that's alive. Something that emanates from me, infusing me with that righteousness, infusing me through the sacraments to become this vibrant living thing, a living epistle in a world that needs more light to read. I'm grateful for all of you. My son in the background, apparently, (laughs) it's good timing because we got to go. I'm grateful for all of you, though. I'm grateful for all of you for this year. It was fantastic. I'm sorry I didn't get back to the comments. Make sure, look, if you like the comments, if you like engaging in that, and you're like, man, I wish that he had more time to talk, go over to the Wolfpack chat. If you say, I've got a lot of apps already, then that pretty much tells me that you could get rid of three or four or 20 apps on your phone and replace it with one. Replace it with one and say, here it is right here. It's got resources, a book club, a prayer chain, and 200 wolves that are getting together, that wolf pack that gets together, prays with each other, learns, lives, loves, and, by the way, laughs, (laughs) and has a good time in the meanwhile, because Christ is king. Christ is king, and no matter how bad it gets, we can sit there and say, he's king. He's king right now, and we know he's got a plan. And we're good with that. In fact, I kind of love it. I love it whenever something is so bad that I look and say, I don't understand any way out of this. How are we going to possibly do it? And there's a twinkle in our Lord's eye and in our Lady's eye. There's a twinkle. And in that twinkle of light is your reflection. You're part of that. You are part of that movement that's marching forward with joy in your heart, cheerfulness in your heart, contrition for sins but the kind of contrition that doesn't paralyze you. It doesn't, you're not, you're not drowning in despair. You're not in a whirlpool wondering, what am I supposed to do? God saved you. God made you. God saved you. And he's given you great instruction. Saints, we can follow in their footpaths, sit on their shoulders and see far ahead and know that the sun's getting closer and closer to us all the time. Until next time, never give up, keep on smiling, and momentum mori. See you in 2022. I wanted to make people dream bigger thoughts.